Building upon what was just said, we're going to go ahead and talk about two of the pillars. We've done industrial, we've talked about operation science. Now let's talk about autonomous and digital. We've put together a panel of who I believe are some of the, the leading experts involved in this in a variety of uh, ways. Martin Fisher from Stanford, Ravi Rupi from Khalif and James E. Craig, AKA Jim from Chevron. But uh, before we, we jump in with the experts, I just wanna do a little bit of framing that maybe is something that we talked about this morning. But again, the framework that we see for this and, and thinking about autonomous, robotic and digital is this idea that regardless of what we do in construction, companies that are involved in manufacturing and in technology and logistics, if you will, are creating smart assets, whether it is a truck, a crane, a robot for production, or even a hand tool. So I know Stanley Black and Decker and others are actually beginning to put uh, IoT sensors, or as, as Robbie will call it, instrumenting hand tools. So there will be data that will be available from people doing work, okay? So again, this production layer, which is critical, is beginning to produce data that's available. And that data, whether we know it or not, is flowing through a network of various devices, data centers, antennae, whatever the case may be, satellite dishes, and neat, and it's starting to become put in a format that we can use. Now, Robbie's gonna talk about what that means. And just to go back for a sec, Martin's gonna to talk to us about what's happening in the world of robotics and autonomous. And then Robbie's gonna talk a little bit about what's happening and the movement of the data and the consumption of the data, if you will. And then finally, we're gonna look at what can we do with the data? Now we had a hint about that with what Microsoft's doing with the Power BI, all right? And, and there's gonna be an interesting discussion about who even owns the data. But we'll get that to that in a minute. So think about this as the frame. We're going to go up the stack, starting with Dr. Fisher, moving to Robbie, and then to, to Jim. I think what's interesting is, you know, what are your data generators? And I find this, like I said, it's very interesting to me where people are very much dedicated to their critical path schedules and all that other stuff they got going. And very rapidly here, the... The advent of robotics and autonomous vehicles and all the stuff associated with even dumb vehicles that have a GPS um, device on them is going to be creating more data than we know what to do with. And it's already occurring. And we're going to have to figure out how do we deal with that amount of data to create value, right? And what people are really trying to get to is actual insight, whether it's coming through data analysis or uh, data science, okay? So the garbage in, garbage out, or nothing in, nothing out is really what, what we're talking about here. So we're going to start by introducing Martin here as our first speaker about robotics. But I've known Martin, he's been a very close personal friend for a long time. And a lot of this whole journey is because of Martin. I personally had a desire for how to make more money in construction. Was very fortunate to meet Martin when he was doing his uh, PhD at at Stanford, and many of you know Martin, I don't even know why I'm introducing him, but his area of focus early on was the application of uh, 4D computer modeling to better visualize construction. And he's probably forgotten more than most of us have ever thought about. He is on the faculty in the construction engineering uh, management department at Stanford. He also leads the Center for Integrated Facility Engineering that if you're not involved in, I, I encourage you to get involved. He's published over hundred reference papers and uh, several chapters and books and done over 50 uh, keynote lectures on his research. He's worked all over the world. He lives all over the world and it's always interesting to track Martin down, and have a discussion. He holds a, a diploma from, in civil engineering from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. As many of you know, that's an impressive place, or Martin tells me anyways. And uh, he has a MS in industrial 
engineering management and a PhD in civil engineering from construction management from Stanford. So Martin, I'm gonna go ahead and, and hand this over to you. Thank you, Todd and colleagues. Well, thanks for the introduction and thanks for putting on this event. I would say the marriage of, uh, yeah, the things you mentioned, in particular, I would say operation science as a new framework, and then the data we can get from different devices that you just mentioned will dramatically change beyond what we can, I think, even imagine how we plan, execute, renovate, etc. Our our built in. But I will focus uh, mostly on robotics, but reflect a bit on autonomy. And one question I often get is, yeah, you do all this work in robots, uh, with robots, and you know, aren't robots taking my job away? And as I thought about this, is they, at least the experience we have so far, is they will only, the robots will not so much take your job away, the robot, the application of robots by your competitor will take your job away. So that's hence the maybe somewhat cooperative title, but I think that's really the decision you have to make is, you know, will construction robots take your job or your competitor's job? Meaning it's really you that are still for the time being in the driver's seat, that the robots are not anywhere close to being smart enough or autonomous that they will really take things over. And the teams that the construction teams that have embraced it as a new tool, they have really actually already made uh, significant progress very quickly. And those that have sort of rejected it and as well, the guys, you know, taking my job, those crews have of course struggled with bringing them in. But if, you know, reflect on projects today, right? We see lots of tools being used. I mean, but still an amazing amount of sort of manual or semi-manual or you know traditional work and the future looks of course much more connected integrated with uh, information flowing as todd alluded between people tools devices and, uh, and the building parts themselves so where are we in terms of robots helping us with this uh, transition. I have to admit that I was uh, a couple few years back quite uh, skeptical when uh, one of my PhD students, and I should have thanked her, Cynthia, approached me and said, you know, I would really like to study robots in construction. Yeah, we've tried this before. Uh, it was one of those old guys in denial. We have tried this before and it didn't really work. And, and then she said, well, maybe we should take another look. And so actually we looked at the precursor of the Hilti quite carefully on the application on the project in Norway. And I have to, as you will see from the data, I had to sort of revise a bit my thinking about robots, where they are, but I'll come to that. The, the, the question for sure arises as you are uh, reading about a new robot almost every day that supply for construction and investments in, in this field. Well, you have to decide, you know, which of these robots works for you in the context of your schedules, your projects, you know, your budgets, et cetera, your challenge. And this is a, a task that will be with us for some time because it will be a long time before it's just robots to build projects. But I think if not already today, but very soon, you will need to figure out how to incorporate robots into your crews or have them work with your crews or become a tools, a tool of your crews. And, uh, and for that, we developed uh, through many applications, a robotics evaluation framework. So we don't have to invent the wheel again and again, because the question is basically, so robot feasible, which has to happen in the context of your product organization process of your project, because they all shape what your project is, but then the same also the robot. And we need to see the fit. Is the robot fit to the project? And is the task fit to the robot that needs to? This, of course, has to happen in the context of the typical objectives that every project has, safety, quality, schedule, and cost, which, of course, are prioritized by the client and project objectives that you have to reach. And uh, so based on that, basically thinking, a systematic way of thinking through these questions, it forces you to collect data and 
and uh, that support the analysis and comparison between your traditional and the robotic supported way, then end up with recommendations. So we were able to, over the last uh, couple of years, study 14 robots with 13 contractors in eight countries. And I'll just share a couple of quick examples just to illustrate and the sort of summary impact that we have seen so far from these uh, 14 robots in comparison with uh, traditional way of doing work. So one is this drive all robot that's developed by a company Canvas here in the Bay Area. And that has been, it's been tested on quite a few projects. There's some competitive uh, products out there as well. But basically what we see here is uh, when we look at the comparison, you get a drive all level five finish at level four cost. And many developers, if you're a property developer, then you'll know what this means, but basically you get the highest level finish at the cost of a, the one level below, which is typically what is specified because the highest level finish tends to be too expensive. And it, it does offer time reduction because it, it tackles the, the drying time, but it also requires, enables, depends how you want to look at it, a new business model because the tasks get broken up differently. And that's uh, something we see actually in quite a few robot applications. Another robot we studied was a robot tying robot on a uh, bridge uh, project together with uh, Trailer Brothers. And I was a robot layer in college. That's how I made my money. Now I'll probably be paid a little bit less. Uh, in that sense, yes, it would take that part of my job away. But it does uh, 1,200 ties per hour for a bridge deck. What we saw is a 21% scale reduction, 25% cost reduction. But something we see again and again in most robot applications, a uh, significant decrease in strenuous work. So significant health and safety benefits and a uh, reduction in rework and in waste. So as I said, uh, these are just two examples from the 14 robots we studied. Looking across the 14 and uh, the comparisons we found is that we saw on the safety, especially on the strenuous work, a 25 to sometimes 100% improvement. Basically, the, the work was just that part of the work was eliminated. So significant health and safety benefit, which I think is, is really important in the context of the shortage of, of craft labor, that they can stay in the job longer because they have yeah, better jobs. We saw a significant improvement in accuracy and with that reduction in rework. And then on the schedule and cost side, it was very much a mixed bag. We saw some applications like, for example, layout drone, um, incredible reduction in time and cost, 90%. And then we saw other situations where there was an increase in, in duration and cost because of the, the robot. There were still typically the other benefits. Hence, we will need to study these robots in the context of our work for the foreseeable future, hence this uh, framework that should help you make these managerial decisions. We've also started to look into, well, what should you do on-site, off-site? It's uh, interesting how the robots are changing this uh, question uh, because all of a sudden some work on-site becomes more feasible that you would want to shift off-site, but of course there can be other reasons why you shift it off-site or on-site. And uh, so we haven't done quite as many comparisons here. This one was also on, on the drywall side on, on framing and comparing traditional and on-site robotic with off-site robotic work. We saw in this particular case study, of course, your numbers could be different. Again, a significant increase in, in the safety or the health and safety and a decrease in schedule, but also an increase in cost, which was obviously quite significant. So probably made it really cost prohibitive, even though the other benefits would have been nice to have. But as you can see, the cost for this particular application on those projects was still a bit uh, too high. But in any case, main point here being, we are really confronted with opportunities to make work on site of that is safer, higher quality, and uh, typically faster. The cost is uh, sort of the, really the big variable that sometimes also 
moves in a good direction and sometimes not. So we may have to be creative there for a while, but then the same is true also with the mix of on-site, off-site work. So we have to uh, do the process design. Of, and of course, that relates very much to the product design as well with more knowledge and more carefully, but we also getting more data. So what uh, I've shown you is basically a way of, as you develop in the project to think already about how you're going to bring robots to your work and what you're going to do on site and off site. But we've also seen that uh, the current version of robots, while having already quite positive impacts. And so I was frankly a bit surprised personally by the many um, good positive impacts that robots already have, even though they're still quite early, I would say. The, we also found that there's very few tasks in construction because of the unstructured that a robot can do by itself. So it's always a human robot collaboration. And um, that's an area where we're doing quite a bit of research because that's something we need to improve, I think, significantly. We, so we can leverage what people are good at and what robots are good at. Because even when you do offsite fabrication, then you still have you know, quite a bit of work to do on site. And as quite a bit of it is, is repetitive that could be done at least mostly by a robot and probably again to higher accuracy and um, but we need to find ways of of teaching the robot so we've explored the human robot collaboration for drywalling painting bolting welding and joint sealing and um, actually developing a a model to teach a robot how to weld in uh, sort of you know small places where otherwise you would have a lot of setup cost. But many projects uh, have these kinds of situations where you need to weld hundreds of columns to base plates or things like that, or need to put a base plate to which you can then bolt a column or things like that. And the difficult thing here is to, to do this totally auto autonomously would require a lot of technology in terms of vision and ability to correct and ability to recognize clutter and all kinds of things. So things that are unrealistic for a project site, what strikes us as more realistic is to teach a robot the things that are really repetitive, which is putting the weld at the plate once the robot is at the plate. And so that for that we can in a virtual environment, first of all, we are also using a virtual environment to design this human robot collaboration. And then we can use it to interact with the actual world. So we can have this basically augmented reality approach where a human is with a haptic interface. And if you haven't experienced the haptic interface, you should find a way to do that because it's um, remarkable how much feedback you can, what kind of feedback you can really get in terms of um, guiding a robot. And so the idea is that, for example, um, a human would guide the robot to the base plate, but then the robot would have learned, okay, yeah, now I'm at this corner, I'm going to weld myself. So if you had several robots, you could see how, you, how a human could guide many robots to many locations. And maybe in some areas, the robot could eventually learn to go from base plate to the, to the next base plate. That's certainly within the realm what looks feasible. But we have developed this uh, simulation environment, um, including haptics and basically an augmented reality uh, approach to explore human robot collaboration and then to design the particular robot capabilities and human capabilities so that they can be deployed safely and, and productively in, in the middle of actually testing uh, the first prototype on this. So I'll report on that. And, in a few months. But this is a very exciting area in terms of, I think, human robot collaboration. In, instead of fully going fully autonomous, basically start to teach the robot degrees of autonomy that work for the people you have on site and that work for the conditions that you have on site. And finally, then the last bit you're probably wondering is the design always fit for robotic construction? And that's also something we've learned as we worked on these case studies, 
that uh, you can often quite quickly see, well, if there was just a small change made, the robot would have been deployed much more rapid, much more beneficially. Like here on the first application of the predecessor of the Hilti JBot, they had two diameters of holes and bolts, and that created quite a bit of setup cost and, uh, and switching costs. And the reflection was afterwards that really the, sort of the, the smaller bolts really didn't save hardly anything. It would have been much better to just have one diameter throughout as a simple example. But in a material handling robot that Obayashi is uh, developing and deploying on its projects in Japan, you see also issues of uh, level changes, uh, types of elevators, access issues that if you know them, you can probably incorporate them in the design, and then that makes robotic construction much more feasible. If you don't know about them, then, well, you may have a design that either you have to fix or where you deploy the robots. You know, don't deploy them, lose out the benefits you could have, or deploy them not as efficiently as, as you could. So that's another project we have currently going to figure out, you know, how do we design for robotic assembly to think about of course, dimensions, obstacles, variability in uh, part design, how the joints are, are formulated, tolerances, and so on. So this is where. So what I would say in 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 conclusion, there's definitely robots worthy your attention now. If you are not already using robots on your projects. And definitely, I would say imperative to reflect on your offsite, onsite mix of use of robots and people. And what's a little bit down the line emerging is the human robot collaboration on site and um, the feedback loop with design. As you know, some of these take sometimes a bit longer. So if we put this, Together, right, you saw the robot evaluation framework that helps us uh, guide what robot is applicable and useful for us, and the on and off site question, and then the human robot collaboration design for robotic assembly. Uh, this is connected with a lot of the other information, data related, and, and other technologies that we're seeing that have already been mentioned uh, IoT sensing, logistics management, digital twins. BIM, and so on. And generally speaking, it's a question of management and design, like, like everything. You will have to make your management decisions in terms of where you deploy what robot and a mix of robots and people. And then we have to also think about the design of this human robot environment and then the that includes the, the product design. But that Todd alluded to, to the data side, and this is something that I haven't heard mentioned as much, but I think in the long run will be really a big deal. I mean, I think the health and safety benefits, the quality benefits and uh, schedule benefits we're already seeing are quite a big deal. I think I imagine the cost as with all technologies will get better over time. So I think this, it's, it's very much a real opportunity we have. As I was thinking about, uh, you know, here we are in five years, um, companies have deployed lots of robots and I uh, was wondering who will know more about construction at that point, the traditional construction company or the company that the robot company. And it's very clear the robot company will know so much more when we do these comparisons. It's really hard to get data on the traditional way of doing work, and it's really easy to get data on what the robot does. And, and so because you just get data as you go. So for example, here from this an automated data collection system from Versatile, uh, I think has may have before, but it collects everything a crane is doing. And uh, for the first time in my career, was I able to see for different design conditions, like three different beam conditions, the average installation time and is a precast beams and the variability that um, existed. So you can 
you know, so you see, for example, that beam condition two has a higher average installation time than beam condition one and a really high variability. And beam condition three has an even higher average installation time, but less variability. So these kinds of insights we have been lacking so far, but this really provides now the opportunity to work with all the five levels of optimization, right? I've already alluded to the product and process design interaction. And uh, now we're getting data on the variability, which helps us then, as you know, from other sessions, understand the whole production system. And we also get data on cap capacity utilization. And so now we can really understand what is the working process that we need for a uh, productive system and how all of these parts interact in terms of the product design enabling or requiring a certain process that is enabled by certain types of robots that give you data and so on. So this is a really an exciting world that I'm entering, uh, we are all entering, that um, I look forward to be part of. In case you're a quick plug, in case you wanna do a robot typical work, traditional work comparison, let me know because we will do more of these case studies in winter quarter as we do our construction robotics class. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. I'm gonna go ahead and, and move on here. Excellent presentation from my perspective. A couple things that come to mind. I think a few things. Martin said the robot won't take your job, but your competitor with the robot might. And I would say not having an understanding of how to approach all this might just take, and you might put yourself out of business. What Martin had just presented was all about production, about robotic production and understanding the implications of robotic production. And then, of course, it automatically brings you to the product and process design. And for the life of me, I have no idea why people keep messing around with wallboard when if you're going to use a robot, we need to come up with another type of panelized material that's fabricated complete and the robot welds or fuses the corners. To... But, you know, uh, we started the day off with the Drucker quote. And then finally, this idea that Martin introduced that Keith talked about of how tremendous amounts of data as we said earlier, are going to flow through, from and through that robotic production to inform design, all right? So, so moving on here, because I'm concerned about time and the people upstairs are sending me nasty texts to get moving, we're gonna have Ravi from Cloudleaf talk a little bit about what's going on in this network layer and where all this data that Martin's talking about might might end up. But again, I think, you know, think about what Martin was talking about on the implications of what he just showed. But specifically, Ravi is a technical co-founder and oversees the cloud operations and software engineering for uh, Cloudleaf. He has 31 years of experience in, uh, in software design. He holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from JNT University in India and has done some uh, graduate level coursework at Arizona State University, Tempe. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Ravi. Okay, so it's a great to be on this uh, panel also. Last year we went through a, a next generation of supply chains kind of thing. We'll touch a little bit on that, but mostly uh, they, there's just a lot of progress that happened since last year to uh, this year in terms of the IoT in general and then construction in specific way, you know, how the you know things are applied to construction. The picture, the way it's evolving is like Todd said and Martin kind of said, there's a data acquisition is becoming really commoditized. We used to talk about until last year, sensors and, you know, a sensory kind of streams coming in. The lot of the shift happened, you know, there's multiple changes that's happening, right? You know, typically the whole digitization of the supply chains, you know, meaning there's a discrete view that was happening, both the inbound, outbound logistics versus, you know, in the warehouse, it changed into a, a bit of a continuous modeling through a digital twin. So, I mean, digital twin typically is talked in the different contexts, but in this context, it's like a supplier networks, you know, your routes, your transportation um, modes, and all of these things are modeled into a world where you see a connected view, basically, right? So that's just the modeling of the portion of it. We'll talk a little bit about the AML at the end of it. 
the whole data acquisition, if you kind of step back a little bit, these are all signals coming through the network. These signals are the sensors through cellular networks, through satellite networks, different backhauls, whether it's a flights, you know, whether it's a, a, a oceanic kind of vessels. So signals of different kinds, devices, carriers, and different other kind of, you know, carriers. So you just, there's a multiple signal sources. Integration has never been a, a problem. Enterprise integration has been there. So getting these signals wired up to a bigger picture into feeding that into the digital kind of became like the, the, the theme basically, right? You know, it kind of evolution to the next stage into the modern construction. Signal attribution. So typically when you look at the, you know, certain things that are moving within this uh, ecosystem, you kind of have a nesting of items. Ultimately, you get a view on a transportation system like a ship or a truck or something, a container, but not to the level that you go to the final asset itself, like a pipe or, you know, a, the boxes in a, in a pallet and things like that. Our goal is not even a goal, it's happening today is, is go, you know, acquire the signals from a, a, a flight or wherever, right, a truck, but attribute those signals into the individual item level so that you get a visibility in this network. We used to have, uh, what do you call like a, a continuous visibility in a discrete silos, right? That is changing. That means the whole picture, these silos are completely, and I'll talk about that a little bit in the context of the digital twin, these silos are completely getting stitched up. You know, if you have a suppliers, both on the supply side or the, on the manufacturing and the outbound logistics side, they're all getting connected basically to make it a one continuous a, a, a stream of a, a model basically, right? If you look at the construction, what are the different use cases you see? The whole data acquisition and then the IoT can, can help or transform, right? One is the modeling itself, forming a bigger network you and your suppliers and then the you know networks transportation networks all of that just modeling that the whole construction information modeling is a key thing so that you don't have a siloed view you have a, a complete view right then when you're dealing with the sites and the monitoring where majority of the work is happening real time remote site maps who what where kind of a view you know people equipment tools all of that view right Sensors and trackers and the drones, a lot of these are like a, a signal sources that kind of give you that visibility, including the machines, you know, just devices, all of these robots also like Martin talked about in the session before this, they're all signal generators and kind of helping this bigger picture. When it comes to the people, you know, the wearable tech, I know it's, it's happened in the consumer world, but it's also seeping into the construction world basically and start to utilize, they're getting sophisticated signals kind of are really helping to build a, a bigger picture of, you know, the efficiencies and resource management. Once construction happens, you know, the whole new thing about the green buildings, the intelligent building management, they're all still going through the same uh, sensory kind of, you know, signals coming in to, to manage it after. Todd talked a little bit about resource management. Tool tracking is kind of scenarios, I think that's it's we kept seeing actually is like as another additional use cases into the construction world check in check out and you know put them in you know renting them all of that kind of things new use cases are coming on into to, to utilize these kind of advancements so this is a, a picture we had last year a bit of a painting this looks like a continuous spectrum right that's what happened this year right in a way this how we looked at you know the thing in the last year you know which is let me just go if this can, okay, doesn't move. Uh, okay, so this is basically this, how we viewed as a silos, right? You know, we viewed the entire efficiencies and the IoT supply chain network within a four walls from the warehouses. We viewed this as a, you know, inbound logistics and then the outbound logistics, basically. That completely, those lines are getting blurred. Um, meaning like you, know, you have a one continuous modeling for the digital networks or digital twins. So that, that thing is a past. So if you look at modeling your value chain 100% now, instead of silos, now let's say imagine you're bringing a, a supplier on board, you know, supplier has its own network and you're connecting these two networks through digital twin. It, it's as simple as, you know, basically connecting these graphs of these uh, 
uh, these networks. And then it becomes a form of bigger networks. I'll talk about a little bit what the, this kind of a modeling allowed is bringing on board sub networks and then connecting them together and then allowing a data sharing, right? That's what it kind of made possible from a modeling side of it. And the visibility side, we talked last year, you know, because that was the beginning of some of these things that are happening. A lot of the visibility now, the big, the minute you kind of have a, a hundred percent modeling side of it, these gaps, the silos gets connected, the visibility kind of now increases to 80 to 90% across the value chain. Ultimately in the construction, the simple question that gets asked, is the material going to be there when I need it, right? It doesn't matter where it comes from, whether it's raw material or finished goods, you know, to the site. And this is these two, the whole digital twin based modeling plus the, you know, signal acquisition through various means is kind of providing an answer to that basically with the higher level tools on the top. So this is a bit of a kind of a, a overview. If you see these things, what I'm highlighting here, these are all signal sources. These are not necessarily just devices anymore. Carrier signals, for example, you know, if you have certain goods getting transferred through the carriers or the, or the supplier networks, those signals will come in along with the device-based kind of signals. If you have certain things that are transported through the oceanic kind of vehicle, through satellite as a backhaul, those signals will come in. And ultimately, you're, ex you're kind of attributing these signals all the way from the top level shelf, like and if you take a truck, you know, transportation management to your containers to all the way to the, to the end, you know, a, a, a kind of assets that go into, into, into pallets kind of thing, right? They're going from the raw material on the inbound logistics side, same signals that are generated and same tracking is happening. This is part of the network, basically. And then the, within the four wall way, how, you know, you could be using RFID systems. You could be using a BLE. You could be using satellite based. You could be using GPS based trackers. doesn't matter in transit kind of sense. They all generate signals and you get a one continuous normalized view of where things are, you know, how, you know, how they're moving and, and you get them in, in time kind of view. A little bit of breakdown. If you look at a, in the manufacturer side of it, the, the working process and a factory tracking side, basically, right? There's a different kind of, you know, again, uh, signal generators are there. You go back on the receiving side, raw material receiving side, you get an acknowledgement saying that you got the, the right amount of the, the raw materials coming in. And within the warehouse, basically, you're going through a different work cells for work in process, you get a view into that also, you know, starting with the, you know, the raw material inputs to finish goods when it ends, you know, step one to step N. And these sensors are giving you a view of how they're moving, what is the velocity, you know, and, and of my finished goods. So finished goods, finally, when I end up in the outbound dock, so you get a complete view in this side of the picture, basically, right? So, that's again through the signal generators, various kinds. You know, there is a there is a signal that gets an at, attached to the boxes, pallets, and then you know there's a zone sensors, there's a you know whatnot, any kind. And then there is a, a these days the whole mobile model is in the picture too. You know, you have a you know like a, a barcodes and RFIDs that are there, scan through that, you get a view from those signals also to to finally into into your information system basically. Okay, so this is a components in transit. Basically, finished goods, you know, getting into the outbound, you know, into the job sites. It's the same thing there, different kind of a signal generators, basically going through different kind of backhauls, you know, satellites or cellular. There's a GPS trackers, condition trackers, like, you know, where shock and other kind of condition is fairly common if you're transporting, like, you know, goods that are shock sensitive, like, your windows and so on and so forth, attach it to them. You get a view in real time. You know, if there's a, a, some kind of damage happens, this is all real time as it's happening through the network, right? You know, the, the things are loaded into the trucks and then the gateways that are living in the outbound lock, you know, the dock kind of, you know, says that, yep, it's living the manufacturer's site now and then it's in the in transit and then where exactly it is, what is the ETAs, all of those gets collected and then, you know, it. it it kind of, you know, you start to get a view of, you know, where the progress of this uh, transportation model is. And now in the delivery side of it, and where the, where the assembly is happening, 
the finished components are delivered to the job sites and you get the same thing. It's auto acknowledgement that's happening for the sensor saying that, yep, received the goods. Again, through signals are kind of giving you a view, but ultimately there is a higher level software, higher level you know, functional view is being built, which is, you know, there's a geofence alerts are happening, or it's the ETS are saying, hey, it's a 30 minutes ETA to the job site, so you can line up your labor and other things. So, you know, when the exceptions are happening, you get those notifications. All of that is happening in real time in a truthful way, right? When something the system says it's 30 minutes away, it is 30 minutes away in a way, unless there's a, you know, some risk or some, you know, accidents, other things involved there, right? A lot of this is logic that gets delivered through these notifications and the exceptions basically. So here is the fun part, right? You got a lot of data, you acquired it. You kind of used all hey, the- Robbie, can we just go another 30 seconds? Is that all right? Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'll try to wrap it up by then. Okay. Okay. So this is the this is a control watchtower. You're trying to build a higher level kind of metrics on the views basically of these signals coming in. Right. So, so, you know, where and what and all that thing, it's the same thing here. You know, you can start to build a lot of fun analytics here on time delivery cycle times, you know, the whip turns and so on and so forth, using that data, uh, pretty much you're working on a, on a true data. That's a, that's giving you a real picture there. Same thing with the in-transit logistics metrics, transit time, on time deliveries and so on and so forth. The minute you have a signal ac acquisitions and you transform the data, you can start to formulate a lot of these, you know, very useful analytics. So I'll take like around 30 seconds on this one. We are, we started with the raw data acquisition. We built some analytics. We acquired the data, built analytics. What is happening is basically the next level is the baby steps are happening around uh, the whole data science. Imagine millions of parts are getting transported, huge digital networks. It's very hard to handle, deal with, you know, like a general, a business rule centric approach. So a lot, a lot of this is now getting to the next level through the data science. You feed a lot of this data, which is the real data and the cleaned up and quality oriented data start to build machine learning models on it. Now, ETA predictions is a very commodity now on this top of the data. Anomaly detections, exceptions, basically. You don't want to deal with the normal on these millions of parts. You kind of want to deal with the exceptions. So those kind of things are already happening through this thing in the IoT space with the large amounts of data access in the networks. So I'll kind of pause there, hopefully wrapped up within time and then uh, gave some, some in, info into what's happening in the real-time world of uh, IoT and the construction. Thank you very much, Ravi. Uh, just to keep things moving along, we'll, mm -hmm. uh, we'll send any questions that we have to you. Okay, so Again, I want to uh, show a quick graphic here for no other reason than to say we have begin to develop a, a model for doing analysis of what kind of data are you capturing. And if this is something that's of, of interest to you, we'll make it available. I think we're working on a paper on this for those of you that uh, are trying to figure out what your strategy is for data. But you can see that the data and the digital are very interconnected with the, uh, with the production. Okay, so we've talked about the robots and the autonomous producing this data along with other things. We've talked about how this data is moving around and uh, spending time with, with Robbie will be fascinating for those that are interested. I'm now going to introduce uh, Jim Craig to talk about the top layer. And one thing I want you to think about is, as Jim's presenting, James talked about the process mapper and what we're doing with production system and what's happening out there. The big secret here is to take the IoT sensors and use them to create the digital twin upon which you apply the operation science. All right, so with that, I'm gonna introduce Jim. Jim's with Chevron's Project Resource Company based in Houston. He's responsible for uh, project production management across the corporation's worldwide major capital portfolio, along with uh, being involved in the innovation team. He joined Chevron in 2004. He's been on a lot of projects all over the world in nasty places. He has a, a degree from Texas A&M in mechanical engineering. He also has an MBA from Rice and, and he's, I believe, a licensed engineer. So with that, Jim, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks, Todd. And uh, thanks for having me. So 
what I'm going to talk about, and, and I, there's been some really good topics today, you know, and, and a lot of things we can learn from each other as, as uh, the things I've listened to, especially BP, Keith, you've heard his pr presentation. There's things that, that uh, we can definitely learn from him as well as Microsoft, right? And how they do their Power BI, which is to me was, was really fascinating. But some of the stuff we're doing at Chevron in this space is, you know, we've been on this journey with operation science for a long time, it feels like, you know, with seriously since about 2017 and dabble a little bit than earlier. So we have a lot of production data out there that we've captured through all our different projects. And so what do we start doing with that data? Well, we started using it to our advantage, right? Because, you know, data is important as you've heard, you know, making sure you get it in and out of the cloud and, you know, also standardization of data to make sure you understand what you have and you can manipulate to be able to be able to have the best utilize yourself so you can increase your project performance, right? So, you know, one of our projects, you know, we, we capture a lot of variability through Chevron PM, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. And we're able to use that to that variability to start looking at when we started going into some production planning of, okay, what's some big variability impacts out here that are keeping us from getting work done, right? And one of we learned at one of our sites was weather impacts, right? There's always causing us delays, right? People weren't thinking about, oh, the wind's going to keep us from a heavy lift or something like that. And so... We started taking the data we we're getting from our project manager, the Chevron production manager, and integrating it with, you know, just some standard data speeds of what the weather is going to be like tomorrow. And that helped us a little bit in our production planning to make sure that if we weren't planning work that we couldn't get done. So it helped us be forward looking in this space, which was very powerful in helping us, you know, kind of eliminate that variability, right? We also looked at things like task completion, right? We started getting a lot of data in this and we looked at some algorithms and started looking at, okay, we know this task isn't gonna, isn't gonna happen, right? We noticed that 80% of the time it doesn't happen. So what can we do to prevent that? This allowed us to be very forward looking in our planning, right? Which again, helps us re reduce that variability and help us reduce the cycle time out there at the site when we're doing our construction activities. And then, you know, I think Robbie talked about data can come from anywhere, right? We, we do a lot of, motor vehicle transportations in some areas of our operation and this one project we had a lot of vehicles moving around so as part of that you know we to keep people safe because people MVCs as we call them is one of the number one injury makers and on our sites and within the corporation so we put some instrumentation out there to make sure drivers are staying alert and to making sure they're staying safe and as a result of that, we started collecting data on truck routings and how they were going around the site, right? And this allowed us to use this to help optimize those truck routings to one, reduce cycle time, you know, and really be able to get some benefits of how those trucks were moving around, right? Especially in our dewatering operation, because the site had a lot of dewatering going on and it really helped us optimize that so we could remove that variability um, in that system, which again, you know, you never know where you're gonna get your data from. You never know how you're gonna use it, but once you get it, and you put it in the power of the people actually using it, you can actually get some really good benefits from it, which is a, which is a really nice benefit. Um, kind of going on the next slide, you know, there's lots of stuff out there, you know. We, you know, we're in this world and we're thinking about how we can do it all the time. You know, we're always looking at, you know, how can we, you can see here, right? How can we be better on our projects, you know, making sure we have competitive, predictable projects. Chevron's went through a big transformation recently, you know, we realized that data is really important mm -hmm. and how can we make things reduce cycle time with it? How can we make our efficiency and operations and how can we use that, right? So you see a lot of things in here around project, you know, project management, you know, because we do have Chevron PM out there and we do get a lot of data from it, but we are doing it on the engineering side too, right? We're looking at operational data. How can we pull that back into our designs? How can we get design standardization? How can we get this data moving between our digital twin? You know, starting our digital twin early when we identifying concepts and taking that all the way through and handing that out to operations. So there's a lot of things we're working on, right? And it's an emerging market. And, we, and we're trying to team with various aspects in the industry and so we can get there because we know that data is extremely important, right? And right now our performance data, I mean, we are sucking it into our data lake four times daily right now, right? Which again, gives you an immense amount of data that you can do this. And again, it enables our projects to be able to be more predictive rather than be more backwards looking because we have real time data we can analyze. And it also, you know, allows us to, to really take that data. And, and as Mark mentioned earlier, he talked 
a lot about modeling, looking at variability, looking at whip, you know, looking at, you know, where's the optimum place to be. And we have taken that data and actually have modeled portions of our project, right? From a complete project, you know, from all the way through to very small pieces of engineering if we need to. You know, we can take it and say, okay, how's our ISO production going in engineering? How's that being fed to fabrication? We model that stuff, right? We have the data, we can look at it. We can take instant data, you know, from our production planning session, which I'll talk about a little bit, a little bit later. And we can do that. We've become very good at it and very predictive. And we can say, hey, we need to add people. We can tell you which people we need to add. So we've matured a lot in this journey that we've gone through, which has been, it's been quite eye-opening for us. So how do we collect this data? Again, you know, we use a tool similar to what Hess do you was talking about earlier, you know, teamed up with SPS and we have we kind of rebranded Chevron Production Manager. That tool is very powerful because it allows us to work with the people doing the work identify the processes, map out the processes, which James showed on the PPI website. We take those processes, right? And depending on where we're on the project, we work with the people doing the work and we generate. And production schedules are usually about two weeks in advance from looking at it. And we do that, then we work with the production team and we have the production planning. We go out to execute the work. What are you gonna do? What are you not do? And that allows us to capture variability, allows us to capture and resourcing and be able to make the right decisions as we go through our project execution, which again, you know, we've been on this journey for a while and we've learned a lot. And we still have a lot more to learn as we go through this. So we got a huge library of standard processes now, right? And we, we learned that, you know, we did some cross sharing with Ford and we learned that, you know, when they design a vehicle, they you not know, only have a bill of material, but they have a bill of process, a BOP as they call it, and they integrate those into engineering. And so that's something that we've been looking at quite, quite, quite intently to see how can we merge those going forward and really get that how into the design early when we're doing that design, which we have done a little bit of, uh, so we have, a, a little, what we have is from there, we have, you know, we, we, from that standard processes, a pro person can go to a, a standard processes and here's the library of it. And I can tell you right now that this library has not only engineering processes in phase three and phase four, which is feed uh, engineering as well as detail engineering. We also have procurement processes in there. We have construction processes in there as well as some fabrication. And one thing you gotta remember is that these processes, no matter where you are in the world, are the same, right? You do the engineering the same. You do a PID the same way you do it in Houston as you do it in London. You, you put a piece of pipe together the same way you do in Kazakhstan, the same way you do in Australia, the same way you do here. So these things are very transposable, which is, is nice because you can use this, like I said, anywhere, right? So, you know, we have a, a library of standard processes. You can pull from that process. And from there, you can say, okay, if I'm in construction, how can I make sure that I'm doing the right work in the right sequence? And if you're engineering, you can get into a different type of design process. We talked earlier, which is really around concurrent design. And so with that, you know, you can take your bill of process, which I think uh, it was Mark earlier that says you almost have a 3D twin of your of how you're going to build it. And you take that with the design and you integrate that, right? And we did this in on, on a project where we knew we were doing some electrical cutovers. We already had all the work processes mapped out. We had the design, we did some 3D laser scanning and we merged those and we call FEL2 or phase two to really try to, cycle, to reduce that cycle time of that engineering and, and advance the maturity of engineering further than we would before we went into what we call feed and then detailed design. So it's uh, still working through it, but it's been a good success so far, which is nice. Again, there's a lot of things you can do with data once you get it out there, once you understand what you have and, and where you can go with it. So again, this is just a high level, you know, everyone has a cloud. I heard earlier, understand your cloud, understand where the hell your data is going in your cloud, you know, and this is kind of high level how it flows into our data warehouse as well as our data lakes. You can see we have a lot of data around production management. We are utilizing Power BI to go out there and, 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 and grab data that we need and be able to manipulate it. So it help us be more predictive on our projects rather than backwards looking, which again is a huge enabler to reduce cycle time and have predictable projects, which is a huge focus of Chevron right now. I can't tell you how big it is. And of course, we also have, you know, the same type of situations for designs. Again, we're looking to take an operational data, you know, how's that infect decisions and equipment we pick, 
how are we doing our 3D digital twin and taking that all the way through the design life, how we get the, the how, the work processes into that digital twin so we know what we're building before we go build it. So then we can pretty much simulate everything, building it, operating it before we even get out, out there. Again, taking pieces from the automotive and manufacturing world, we know it's not exact exchange, but taking those elements where we can, learning from them and seeing what we can do to better our projects and better our processes. So like always, data is huge, right? And the lake is gonna keep growing as it will always will. You need to make sure you're smart about it. You know what you're gonna do with it. Make sure you get it in a standard format. We're doing a lot of that standard formatting in our cost data and project control so we can be able to, to compare projects globally. Engineering is the same way. We have different assets, different codes. We're trying to get that standardized so we can use it and be able to use it to our advantage. And at the end of the day, this has become a big revelation as we own that data. So we know that this is going to change the way we work internally as we know it's going to be able to change the way we work with our strategic suppliers because it is a different business model, different, different business proposition that we'll have to work through and don't know the answers yet, but we know we have to work through it. But Chevron has realized there's a lot of value in this data and we're going to own it. We're going to use it. Thank you. A uh, couple things just to wrap it up really quick on this particular session. Some things that I thought were amazing is what Martin is talking about. What's going on with the robotics, complete game changer, all production based. We were texting while Martin was speaking. He wasn't talking about flying drones around and run robots to measure progress. He was talking about doing actual production work, right? We heard about how things are starting to move around the data layer through the networks from Ravi that I, I would tune into what CloudLeaf's doing. I took a little snippet here from Jim and from um, the Microsoft presentation from Efren. And I, you know, this is a really big deal right here, in my opinion. Microsoft's getting it every two hours. Chevron's getting it four times a day daily. This data is going into a central data lake. And what's gonna happen if you put all this together is we're automatically through this production data flowing through these networks, we're going to move to what we call intelligent production where the digital twin is gonna create itself. All right, so something to think about, the digital twin is gonna create itself and as the digital twin creates itself, right, we're able to model, simulate, analyze and optimize based on what Mark was talking about, what Mark was showing, right? And then obviously there's the element of control that both uh, Microsoft, well, Microsoft Petronas and Chevron talked about, okay? So control really is gonna to start to, at some point, move from human and management to more control of the, the elements that are creating the production. Again, whether it's vehicles that are moving or it is robots that are doing work, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and hand this back to first take it over at this point. Thank you, Todd, great. So